Hi everyone, I'm Seth Spinner, the Spotted Lanternfly Survey and Outreach Coordinator at the Office of the State Entomologist at the University of Kentucky. Today I'll discuss a new pest of concern for Kentucky, the Spotted Lanternfly, and its potential impacts and how to manage this pest. The Spotted Lanternfly, or Lycorma delicatula, is a plant hopper native to China and possibly Vietnam, Bangladesh, and India. Though this insect has only been known to science for less than a century, it has been becoming a substantial pest in places around the world over the last 20 years. In 2005, it was first reported outside of its natural range in South Korea, where it was causing substantial damage to grapevines. Several years later, it was found in Japan, and in 2014, it was detected for the first time in the U.S. and Berks County, Pennsylvania. This insect has become a major pest of trees, grapes, other fruits, and landscaping plants in its introduced range, causing billions of dollars in economic losses a year. Over the last eight years, this insect has been spreading throughout the mid-Atlantic states, invading New England and the Midwest, and it's likely that it will soon begin to expand into Kentucky. The spotted lanternfly is a sap-feeding insect and uses a long, needle-like mouthpart to pierce plant tissues and suck out fluids. Spotted lanternflies are highly mobile, and both adults and nymphs can quickly jump and travel several feet when disturbed. Adults are winged and can fly up to nearly 90 yards without stopping to rest. However, the most important life history trait that's contributed to their spread is their egg-laying habits. These insects can lay their eggs on nearly any hard surface. In natural environments, this would include things like trees and rocks, but outside of these natural areas, they've been known to lay their eggs on things like ice chests, buildings, tires, cars, children's toys, RVs, all sorts of stuff. When they lay their eggs on something like a car or an ice chest, they can be easily transported by humans and invade previously uninfested areas. Now I want to draw your attention to the picture on the bottom right. These are spotted lanternfly egg masses. So on the left is a recently laid egg mass. Adult females cover their eggs with a light gray or beige substance, which we can see in this picture pretty well. Uh, now on the right is, are some older egg masses where we can actually see the eggs. Over time, this covering will wear away and expose the eggs underneath. Now you can see some of the eggs have holes in them, uh, meaning that they have already hatched and nymphs have already emerged. Now another important aspect of spotted lanternfly biology is their swarming behavior. These insects are gregarious, meaning they often congregate together. During the day, they congregate at the base of their host plant, and at night they ascend the stem to congregate in the canopy. When you're in an infested area and you find a high quality host plant, there may be dozens, hundreds, or even thousands of spotted lanternflies congregated there and feeding on that plant. So here we can see the life cycle of the spotted lanternfly. These insects are univoltine, meaning they only have one generation per year. Eggs typically hatch in May or June, and very small black nymphs with white markings emerge. These first instar nymphs are approximately an eighth to a quarter of an inch long, and are sometimes mistaken for small ticks or spiders. These nymphs will molt in June, and then again in July, growing in size but otherwise not really changing much visually. In the late summer, it will molt again into the final juvenile stage, which can be seen here. They will grow to about the size of a nickel and become black and red with white spots. It's thought that these older nymphs need to feed on a specific plant, the tree of heaven, to acquire certain chemicals needed to reach maturity, though they may be able to reach adulthood without feeding on this tree. We'll discuss the Tree of Heaven and its association with the spotted lanternfly further later in this presentation. Now, after acquiring the nutrients needed to mature, spotted lanternflies will molt a final time and emerge as adults in the late summer and early fall. Adults look noticeably different from nymphs. They're about an inch long and look a bit like moths. They have pinkish wings with black dots directly behind the head and a grid of black rectangular bars at the tip of the wing. These adults will begin mating and laying eggs in the fall and die off by the first hard frost of winter. However, their eggs will, can, will survive the winter and hatch in the early summer, starting the cycle over again.
Here we can see a map showing the current distribution of the spotted lanternfly in the U.S. Infested counties are blue, and the little purple dots indicate counties where spotted lanternflies have been found, but no established population is known to exist yet. You can also see that some areas are outlined in red. These are areas that have been put into quarantine by state governments. No materials possibly harboring spotted lanternflies can be moved outside of these areas without proper inspection. We can see that this insect has become pretty widespread in the mid-Atlantic states and that they're also present in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Ohio, Virginia, West Virginia, Indiana, Michigan, and North Carolina. The spotted lanternfly was first found in the U.S. in Berks County, Pennsylvania in 2014. It's believed that they are introduced in a landscaping stone shipment from China. It's thought that these smooth, flat stones had spotted lanternfly egg masses attached to them and that these eggs survived the trip from China to Pennsylvania. Over the next several years, the insects spread throughout Pennsylvania and the neighboring states. Fast forward to 2021, and a well-established population of the spotted lanternfly was found in southeastern Indiana and Switzerland County. Due to the large reproducing population and the abundance of old egg masses, it's thought that these insects had been in Switzerland County for several years before they were first detected. When it was detected, it was an isolated population and pretty far away from any of the other counties with established populations. The owner of the property where this infestation is moved from the quarantine zone in Pennsylvania and moved their RV with them to the property. We think that the spotted lanternflies in Pennsylvania had probably laid eggs somewhere on his RV and were then transported to Indiana when he moved. In 2022, we saw further expansion of the spotted lanternflies introduced range. In June, North Carolina detected its first established population in the state in Forsyth County. North Carolina had been intercepting individuals in several counties for the last few years, but this is the first established population of spotted lanternfly detected in that state. Around the same time, a new population of the insect was discovered in Huntington County, Indiana, in the northern part of the state. Then, in August, Michigan reported its first established population of the spotted lanternfly. This population was discovered in Oakland County, which is part of the Detroit metro area. Most recently, the spotted lanternfly was detected in Cincinnati, Ohio, right over the border from us. As we can see, we don't have any spotted lanternflies in Kentucky yet, but judging by the rate of spread in the Northeast and the Midwest and how close they are, it's only a matter of time before this insect pops up in our state. Here we can see a map that shows the suitability of different regions for spotted lanternfly establishment. This is based on the climatic preferences of the insect in Asia, where it is mostly found in regions with temperate climates. White portions indicate areas unsuitable for the insect. Green represents areas of low suitability. Yellow shows moderately suitable areas. And red shows areas that are highly suitable for this insect. Thinking back to the map of the current distribution of the spotted lanternfly, we can see that they have already spread to many of the highly suitable areas in the mid-Atlantic states. We can see other highly suitable areas include the regions around Lakes Erie and Ontario, the southern parts of the Midwest, and even some parts of the West Coast. The agricultural regions of eastern Washington and Oregon, the Central Valley of California, and many coastal areas of California are also highly suitable for this pest. Going back to our region, we can see many areas in the northern part of the southeast are moderately suitable for spotted lanternflies, but most of the deep south and Gulf Coast region is not very suitable for this insect. We can also see that, fortunately, many of the high elevation areas of the south, like the Blue Ridge Mountains in North Carolina and the Allegheny Mountains in West Virginia, are not suitable for this insect, nor are the subtropical regions of the Gulf Coast or the drier regions of Oklahoma in the central and western parts of Texas. Looking specifically at Kentucky, we can see that the area south of Cincinnati is highly suitable and most of the state is moderately suitable for spotted lanternfly establishment. How would the spotted lanternfly spread to these suitable regions? Well, it's usually accidentally spread by humans. It's sometimes moved through the nursery trade or in timber shipments, 
and it's also commonly spread by people who are unwittingly moving egg masses that were laid on their personal belongings, like their vehicles, firewood, outdoor furniture, camping equipment, etc., like with the RV in Switzerland County, Indiana. It can also be spread through commercial shipping, like with 18-wheelers and trains. These insects can lay their eggs on many different surfaces of a vehicle, and commercial truck drivers moving through quarantine zones often legally have to inspect certain parts of their truck for spotted lanternfly eggs before leaving the quarantine zone. But, unfortunately, sometimes mistakes are made and these insects are still transported outside of quarantine zones and into new areas. In the picture at the bottom, we can see a map of Virginia. The thick black line is Interstate 81, while the green counties are areas that are under a spotted lanternfly quarantine, which means these counties have large, well-established populations. We can see that the quarantine zone roughly follows the I-81 corridor, meaning the insects are spreading along this highway, likely due to hitchhiking egg masses on vehicles and goods that are being transported along this route. Here we can see maps showing the probability that the spotted lanternfly will spread to different counties in the U.S. through time. White indicates a 0% probability, and the darker the color, the higher the probability of spread. Here's a prediction for 2022. We can see it's mostly accurate. By 2027, there's a high probability that the spotted lanternfly will have spread throughout the northern half of the southeast, including most of Kentucky and some parts of the Midwest. This trend continues into 2033, with the chances of spread increasing in the western and southern portions of the southeast. At this point, we can also see that the probability of spread increases in the western U.S., with some slight chances of the spotted lanternfly being introduced into California, Oregon, Idaho, Utah, and Arizona. These trends will continue into 2050, with high probabilities that the spotted lanternfly will spread across most of the eastern U.S. and west coast. If the spotted lanternfly were to get into California, there would be substantial impacts to the American wine industry, since the spotted lanternfly is a major pest of grapes, and California vineyards produce roughly 85% of our country's wine. The patterns in these maps roughly match what we saw on the map that showed the suitability of different regions for spotted lanternfly establishment. Based on these predictions, the spotted lanternfly will be a growing issue that we will be dealing with in the coming years here in Kentucky. Now we'll discuss the host plants that the spotted lanternflies have been found feeding on. Its native host is the Tree of Heaven, or Alanthus altissima. The spotted lanternfly strongly prefers feeding on this species. It's believed that this tree produces metabolites that are needed by the spotted lanternfly to reach maturity, though there is some evidence that they may still be able to grow to sexual maturity without these chemicals. This tree is native to the same regions of China as the spotted lanternfly, and this tree has become a major weed here in the eastern U.S., and it's really one of the worst invasive plants in the world. As we can see from the map, it's widely distributed throughout North America, and it's also widely distributed in Europe, and it's invasive in South America, Australia, and Africa. The Tree of Heaven was first introduced to the Western world in the 1740s, during a time when Chinese art and goods were very popular among the nobility and royalty of Europe. It was introduced to Europe by a Jesuit monk who collected seeds while on a mission trip to China. He believed the seeds belonged to a different plant, the Chinese varnish tree, which is a close relative of poison ivy and used to create varnish for use in traditional East Asian wood carving art. Nevertheless, the Tree of Heaven became a popular garden plant in Europe until gardeners noticed its aggressive spread. However, this tree was still introduced into the U.S. around the same time it was introduced into Europe, and it's been spreading ever since. Historically, there are many uses of this plant in China. It was used in traditional Chinese medicine as an astringent, and it was also used in silk production, as this plant is the primary host of the Alanthus silk moth, which produces cheaper, stronger, but less aesthetically pleasing silk than the primary source of silk, the domestic silk moth. Some of the silk produced by this moth can be seen in the picture on the bottom right. It's also been commercially harvested for timber in China and used for cabinetry, making traditional wooden steamers for cooking, and firewood and charcoal production.
The Tree of Heaven is the primary host of the spotted lanternfly, and its widespread abundance in the eastern U.S. is a major factor in the spread of the spotted lanternfly in the region. The Tree of Heaven is a relatively short-lived species, rarely living fat past 50 years of age. However, they are fast-growing and can grow as large as 70 feet in height and 6 feet in diameter. Due to this fast growth, the trees often exhibit irregular growth forms and may have twisted stems. Tree of Heaven can reproduce both sexually and vegetatively. This tree is a prolific seed producer and can send out root and stump shoots when stressed. This tree can quickly regenerate and reinfest an area through stump or root sprouting when it's injured through management activities like cutting, burning, or mowing. This makes the plant particularly hard to manage and explains the rapid spread of the tree. The Tree of Heaven is a shade intolerant plant and will often be found growing in sunny areas like forest edges or old fields. These trees can take advantage of forest gaps created by events like logging, intense winds, or other disturbances. Tree of Heaven often grows well in areas that native trees and other plants just can't really survive. This tree can tolerate pollution and poor soils extremely well, so well it's commonly used in reclamation of abandoned mining sites polluted with toxic waste in its native range. Additionally, the Tree of Heaven is allelopathic and releases chemicals into the soil that inhibits the growth of other plants, which can prevent competing native plants from establishing in the area. Now we're going to move through the other hosts more quickly because I'm sure many of you are already familiar with them. One group of trees particularly at risk of spotted lanternfly feeding are maples. Spotted lanternflies commonly attack maples, including natives like box elders and sugar, red, and silver maple. They also are known to feed on some exotic species that are commonly used in landscaping, like Norway and Japanese maple. Spotted lanternflies can also feed on several species of birch. They've been known to feed on river, yellow, paper, sweet, and European white birch. Hickories and walnuts are also fed upon by the spotted lanternfly. They have been reported feeding on pig nut and shagbark hickory, butternut, and black walnut. Here we can see a few other tree species that the spotted lanternfly feeds on. They've been found feeding on beech, sycamore, yellow or tulip poplar, and several different species of oaks, willows, ashes, and dogwoods. Here's where some of the spotted lanternfly's largest economic impacts are being felt. Fruits. Spotted lanternflies are major pests of grapes and threaten both table, grape, and wine production. The sap-sucking feeding habits of this insect prevents the flow of nutrients to the grapes, which can reduce yield and quality. In Pennsylvania, some producers have reported grape yield losses of up to 90%. Additionally, their feeding can influence the chemical properties of the grapes, making them unsuitable as food and for winemaking. While not pictured here, the spotted lanternfly is also a major pest of hops, threatening the craft beer industry as well. Spotted lanternflies have also been reported feeding on blackberries and raspberries, but they're really more of a concern in fruit tree orchards. This insect has been found to feed on several stone fruit species like cherries, apricots, and peaches. They've also been found feeding on apple and pear trees. This has become a big issue in the fruit producing regions in the Northeast and in Korea. Though not pictured here, the spotted lanternfly also feeds on several other fruits and crops, including mulberries and hemp. Finally, here are some of the garden and landscaping plants the spotted lanternfly has been reported to feed on. They've been found on roses, hibiscus, lilac, poinsettia, service berry, viburnum, arbor vitae, and even basil. Now we've gone over a few dozen of the host plants that spotted lanternflies feed on, but they can feed on many other plants and are known to attack well over a hundred different species. The host preferences of spotted lanternflies can change as the insect develops into adulthood. They can feed on grapes and tree of heaven throughout their life cycle, so we can consider these plants as their primary hosts, but young nymphs can feed on roses and a variety of perennials as well. As they develop, they are able to feed on other plants like walnuts, birches, willows, sumacs, and maples. Spotted lanternfly feeding damage typically will not kill a host plant, but it can weaken and make them more susceptible to other insects and diseases. 
However, they can occasionally kill grapevines and young trees like black walnut saplings. In residential areas, these insects can become major quality of life pests. Large swarms of this insect can become a big nuisance to homeowners and decrease the aesthetic quality of landscaping plants. As I mentioned earlier, these insects can lay their eggs on nearly any hard surface, including buildings, vehicles, and lawn furniture, leading to more aesthetic issues for homeowners. One of the biggest quality of life issues with the spotted lanternfly relates to their feeding habits. These insects feed on sap, which has a very high sugar content. They are unable to fully digest all of this sugar, and like other sap feeders such as scale insects, they excrete this excess sugar as honeydew. These insects excrete large quantities of honeydew all over their host plants and anything underneath them. We can actually see some spotted lanternflies excreting honeydew in the video at the top right. You can kind of see a little stream coming out. That's the honeydew. So honeydew can cause several problems for homeowners and business owners. Honeydew will often ferment in warm temperatures, which can create an unpleasant smell. Additionally, honeydew can also pose a slipping hazard. Several people in Pennsylvania have reported slipping on honeydew-covered steps and porches, sometimes resulting in broken bones. This substance can also attract stinging insects, like bees and wasps, which are attracted to the smell of honeydew. Interestingly, bees sometimes feed on this honeydew, and some honey producers in Pennsylvania have taken advantage of this, making a complex, smoky-tasting honey with spotted lanternfly honeydew-fed bees. Honeydew can also provide a great substrate for the fungus sooty mold. Sooty mold can grow on all sorts of surfaces like mulch, plants, and wood. When this fungus establishes on honeydew-covered leaves, it can block out sunlight and inhibit photosynthesis. Additionally, some homeowners in Pennsylvania have even reported that sooty mold can cause permanent staining to wooden decks and unpainted wooden buildings. The cost of spotted lanternfly control for homeowners can be hundreds to thousands of dollars, depending on the size of their yard and the number of plants that need to be treated. Now, while I mostly focus on homeowners here, these issues could also arise in other places like businesses and public parks. In addition to these health risks and aesthetical issues, spotted lanternflies can cause major economic issues. These insects can reduce agricultural and forestry yields and disrupt horticultural and tourism operations. In Pennsylvania alone, these insects could cause billions of dollars in economic damages and a loss of thousands of jobs per year. In addition to the direct economic effects of the spotted lanternfly, there are also many indirect and induced effects, which we'll go over in the next few slides. This table shows the estimated economic losses that the spotted lanternfly could cause per year just in Pennsylvania if it were to spread across the entire state. In the center of the table, we can see the expected losses, which are conservative estimates of the losses this insect may cause. And on the right, we can see the worst case scenario or the maximum economic losses this insect could cause in Pennsylvania. You can see I've broken down the losses into four different categories. Losses for field crops, specialty crops, ornamental crops, and timber producing trees. Expected annual economic losses for field crops range from a conservative estimate of $4.7 million a year to a worst case scenario of over $15.8 million per year. The field crops that would experience the greatest losses are corn, soybeans, and hay. Specialty crops, such as berries and tree nuts, are expected to experience greater economic losses from the spotted lanternfly. Conservative estimates indicate this insect could cause over $12 million in damage a year to specialty crops, and under worst case scenario estimates, nearly $17 million a year. The specialty crops experiencing the greatest economic losses would include grapes and poem fruits, such as apples and pears. Ornamental crops, like nursery stock and cut flowers, are also expected to experience considerable economic losses. Under the conservative estimates, spotted lanternflies are expected to cause over $25 million of damage to ornamental crops, and under worst-case scenario predictions, 
this insect could cause over 66.5 million dollars in damage to these crops. Finally, we have the estimated economic losses to the commercial logging industry. If the spotted lanternfly were to spread to every county in Pennsylvania, the forest industry is expecting to lose hundreds of millions of dollars a year, ranging from the conservative estimate of $152.8 million a year to the worst case scenario estimate of $236.3 million a year. Some of the trees expected to take the hardest hits are black cherry, northern red oak, and soft maples. At the bottom of the table, we can see the total estimated economic losses for each estimate. If the spotted lanternfly were to spread to every county in Pennsylvania, the state is looking at roughly $195 million to about $335 million a year in direct economic losses from the spotted lanternfly. However, this doesn't even include the potential indirect and induced effects of the spotted lanternfly on the state's economy. In these two tables, we can see conservative and worst case scenario estimates for the direct, indirect, and induced effects on employment, income, contribution to the state's GDP, and revenues. Direct effects in this case are the impacts experienced by the agricultural and forestry industries. Indirect effects are the impacts felt by businesses in the supply chain that supply the agricultural and forestry industries with necessary resources, like a business that sells fertilizers or equipment such as chainsaws or tractors. <clears throat> These indirect effects also include the impacts on the supplier of the supplier, the suppliers of the suppliers of the suppliers, and so on and so forth. This could go all the way down to the iron mining companies that supply the raw materials used to make chainsaws and tractors. Induced effects are a little more complicated. This refers to the impact on businesses where employees of the agricultural and forestry industries and the employees of the industries that supply the agricultural and forestry industries spend their income, like grocery stores, restaurants, and hospitals. The direct, indirect, and induced effects can be seen on the y-axis of these tables. On the x-axis at the top, we have employment, labor income, total value added, and output. Employment and labor income, well, those are self-explanatory. The total value added refers to the contribution to the state's GDP, and the output refers to revenues. Under the conservative estimates at the top, we can see that the combined direct, indirect, and induced effects could lead to a loss of roughly 2,800 jobs, about $153 million in lost labor income, over $231 million in lost contributions to the state's GDP, and nearly $325 million in lost revenues per year if the spotted lanternfly were to spread to every county in Pennsylvania. Under the worst case scenario estimates, this would increase to a loss of nearly 5,000 jobs, over $250 million in lost labor income, approximately $382 million in lost GDP contributions to the state's economy, and over $554 million in lost revenue per year. Under either scenario, these impacts of the spotted lanternfly would be absolutely devastating to many businesses and communities in Pennsylvania. Now here we can see the industries that are expected to experience the greatest impacts if the spotted lanternfly were to spread to every Pennsylvania county under the conservative estimate and the worst case scenario estimate. We can see the industries that experience the direct effects like commercial logging, greenhouse, nursery and floriculture production, and fruit farming, which will experience the worst job losses, loss of labor income, and revenue loss under both estimations. We can also see the support activities for agri the agricultural and forestry sector, which would be experiencing the indirect effects from the spotted lanternfly. The indirect effects of spotted lanternflies on these industries would include the loss of hundreds of jobs and millions of dollars in labor income and revenue a year. Finally, we can also see the sectors that would experience the induced effects, like hospitals, restaurants, and the real estate industry. The spotted lanternfly could cause millions of dollars in economic losses for these industries a year. 
In addition to the economic losses we can see in these tables and in the previous slides, the cost of spotted lanternfly management for the agricultural and forestry industries is expected to exceed $325 million a year. Unfortunately, there have not been any estimates made for the economic impacts of the spotted lanternfly for states other than Pennsylvania, but we can expect those losses to be high. So you've heard about the impacts of this insect, but how are they managed? Well, the first step is monitoring. This can help us know if the pest is present, give population size estimates, and help us know which life stage the population is currently in. We can do this several ways. We can do visual surveys, which is simply inspecting host plants for signs and symptoms of spotted lanternfly infestations. However, the better option is using some sort of monitoring device. Common tools for this include circle traps and sticky bands. Circle traps, which can be seen in the picture on the right, are probably the most commonly used spotted lanternfly monitoring tool. Circle traps are essentially bags made of window screening mesh with two small pieces of wood and some metal wire to provide structure and roughly shape the mesh bag into an upside down funnel. A plastic collection bag is attached at the top of this funnel and these traps are wrapped around a tree and attached with staples, thumbtacks, or twine. These traps take advantage of a common behavior exhibited by the spotted lanternfly. These insects often climb up the trunk of a tree until they reach the canopy, and once at the top of the tree, they often fall back down to the ground and then begin to climb back up the trunk. When you've got a circle trap set up on a tree, the spotted lanternflies will be corralled and funneled to the top of the trap as they ascend the tree. They'll get stuck in the plastic bag at the top and will be unable to escape. Now another monitoring device is the sticky band trap. These traps are pretty simple. They're just a strip of insect sticky tape that you wrap around a tree trunk. As the spotted lanternflies climb up the tree trunk, they get stuck on the tape. We can see this in action in the picture on the bottom left. Now you'll probably notice that the sticky band has some kind of metal wire fencing wrapped around it. Well, unfortunately, a lot of animals like birds, snakes, and frogs can get stuck on the sticky bands and die, so some folks put some sort of wire fencing around it to keep non-target animals away from the tape. Lures aren't typically used with spotted lanternfly traps, but there are a few compounds that have shown potential as spotted lanternfly attractants for trapping, including plant volatiles such as wintergreen oil and leaf alcohol. Finally, a new method that's being developed is the use of spotted lanternfly sniffing dogs. In Pennsylvania, New York, and a few other states, they've trained dogs to sniff out and find spotted lanternflies, but this isn't really a widespread practice yet. We don't have spotted lanternflies in Kentucky yet, but because of the infestations right over the border in Indiana and Ohio, the Office of the State Entomologist is surveying northern Kentucky along the border. This map shows where I'm conducting surveys for this pest. Survey sites are represented by the red dots. I'm doing visual surveys and setting circle traps at nurseries, forests, vineyards, river ports, industrial sites, and transport related areas such as truck stops and interstate rest areas. Fortunately, we haven't found any spotted lanternflies. This chart here shows an IPM approach to spotted lanternfly management. As with other IPM methods, it recommends to begin with the least toxic methods first and only to move on to using pesticides if the other methods don't provide adequate control. We'll start with cultural control. This is pretty simple. You can prevent spotted lanternfly populations from building up in an area if you promote the health and vigor of the plants there. The defense mechanisms of healthy, vigorous plants will be more able to defend the plant from spotted lanternfly attacks. Another cultural management option is removing the suitable host from an area. This is in part what they're trying to do at the infestation in Switzerland County, Indiana. There, they are controlling tree of heaven with herbicides to try to starve out the insect. However, since the spotted lanternfly also feeds on many other plants, some of which are very commercially valuable, this is often not an option. There's also the risk that they may switch hosts and start feeding on a different species after you remove their primary hosts. You can also manage spotted lanternflies through physical means. 
Some of the same tools that we use for monitoring can also be used to control populations of this pest. Circle traps and sticky bands, along with other traps, can be used to capture and kill spotted lanternflies. Other, simpler methods can be used as well, such as squishing the bugs or capturing them by hand to kill later. In the bottom left, you can see a water bottle filled with adult spotted lanternflies. Because these bugs often jump when threatened, you can hold an empty bottle over them, and when they jump, they will get caught in the bottle. You can then place the bottle in the freezer to easily kill them. You can also easily remove spotted lanternfly egg masses by scraping them off of whatever surface they were laid on using something like a credit card or a pocket knife. It's important you make sure that you destroy the embryos in the eggs, which could be done by placing them in a jar with alcohol or hand sanitizer. A new method that I heard about recently from someone who works for New York City's public park system is the use of wireless vacuums. Using a vacuum, you can suck up spotted lanternflies and capture them in the vacuum bag to kill them later in a freezer. I'm not really sure how effective this would be as they just started trying it out, but I would imagine it would work alright on an individual tree level. It may also be possible to get some control of the spotted lanternfly using biological methods. As of now, there are no established biological control programs for the spotted lanternfly, but promoting natural enemies that are already present may help. Spiders and mantises have been reported to attack and feed on spotted lanternflies. Birds have also been reported to feed on this insect. However, the spotted lanternfly sequesters defense chemicals from feeding on the tree of heaven that makes them very unpalatable to some birds and other vertebrates. So you're not necessarily going to get adequate control by relying on predation by these animals alone. There are a few potential biological control agents that are currently being researched, such as parasitoid wasps from the spotted lanternfly's native range, and the fungus Bovaria bassiana, which is often used as a biopesticide. However, there isn't enough research to determine if these would be effective control agents. Now we'll discuss pesticidal management options. As of now, this seems to be the most effective method of controlling spotted lanternflies. Reduced toxicity pesticidal options include insecticidal soaps and horticultural spray oils. These work pretty well, but they have very little residual activity, meaning you'd have to frequently reapply to get adequate control. As for traditional insecticides, we'll split them into contact and systemic insecticides. The systemic options currently recommended include dinotefrin and imidacloprid. Dinotefrin provides excellent and prolonged control. This chemical can be applied through soil drenches, trunk sprays, or trunk injections. So you have a few different options, but they need to be applied between July and September to be effective. This chemical, along with host removal, is what they are using to try to control the spotted lanternfly infestation in Indiana. The other systemic insecticide, imidacloprid, provides less predictable control than dinotefrin. This chemical can be applied through two different methods, soil drenches or trunk injections, but the recommended timing varies between these methods. Applying imidacloprid via soil drenches most occur after the host you are treating has already flowered up until July, whereas trunk injections can occur any time from July to September. As far as contact insecticides go, we have more options. The most effective contact insecticides for managing spotted lanternflies are beta-cyfluthrin and bifenthrin. These chemicals provide excellent control and can remain active against the spotted lanternfly for up to two weeks, meaning you'll have prolonged control. Other contact insecticides include carbaryl, which is the active ingredient in seven, zeta-cypermethrin, malathion, neem oil, and natural pyrethrins. These pesticides can provide good to excellent control, but they have very little residual activity, which means you might have to do more follow-up reapplications to get adequate control. However, as with all traditional pesticides, it's important to take human health and environmental impacts into consideration when deciding which insecticide to use. 
we can see the toxicity ratings for birds, fish, and bees of each chemical on the table on the right. Unfortunately, many of the most effective pesticides are highly toxic to bees, which may be something to consider when deciding on management options. Another important part of spotted lanternfly management is managing their preferred host, the tree of heaven. There are many different ways to manage this invasive plant, but it's important to remember the plant's biology to prevent reinfestation. Cultural management techniques include maintaining a dense cover of healthy native vegetation to shade out tree of heaven since it's a shade intolerant plant. This can work well in forestry settings, but can be hard to implement in other contexts. Physical methods like cutting, girdling, hand pulling, and burning can provide decent control initially, but these methods often cause root or stump sprouting, leading to reinfestation. Another potential method is using biological control. There are several potential biological control agents currently being investigated, like a species of weevil that vectors verticillium wilt, but there are not any biological control programs currently being implemented. Livestock grazing can also help, but there needs to be consistent and prolonged grazing pressure to adequately exhaust the energy reserves in the root system to prevent reinfestation through root sprouting. Currently, the best management option for tree of heaven that we have is the use of herbicides. There are several different application methods used to control this tree, including cut stump treatments, which is when you just cut down the tree and then spray the stump um, with an herbicide to prevent um, sprouting, then foliar applications, basal applications, and something called the hack and squirt method, which is essentially a crude way of injecting herbicides. The hack and squirt method is done by making downward cuts into the tree, past the bark and into the xylem. Then herbicides are sprayed into the troughs created by the cuts to allow the tree to absorb the chemical and transport it throughout the xylem. This is one of the more popular methods for small landowners as it's effective, easy to use, and uses less herbicide than other methods. Correctly managing tree of heaven can help reduce spotted lanternfly populations and reduce the risk of spread of this invasive insect. As we can see, the spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven are very serious invasive pests in the eastern U.S., but the management of these two species often goes hand in hand. While tree of heaven is widespread throughout Kentucky in the southeast, the spotted lanternfly is currently not. However, that can quickly change, and it's likely that these insect, this insect will eventually spread into our state. Just in the last year, three new states have reported established populations of this pest for the first time. The spread of the spotted lanternfly into Kentucky could have serious impacts on our state's hardwood forests, agriculture, nurseries, and homeowners. However, if the spotted lanternfly does spread to our state, we have several management tactics that can help manage both the spotted lanternfly and its preferred host, the tree of heaven, and hopefully reduce these pests' harmful impacts. And that concludes my webinar. I hope you found this informative and that this information will be helpful if the spotted lanternfly ever shows up in your county. If you would like some more information on this pest, there's a fact sheet in the shared folder where you found this presentation that you can check out. Also, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me at seth.spinner at uky.edu. Thank you.